ultra powerful God. Amen. And so the, for the first two weeks, what we did, we did an overview. Today what we're going to do, we're going to dive into the scriptures a little bit and we're going to look at a story and we're going to see God's power on display. And, and then the idea, and so I want to give you what is the goal of this sermon, is the idea, why does God talk about how powerful he is and demonstrate how powerful, because he's egotistical and he wants you to understand that, hey, how great he is? Not necessarily. He is great, not because, that's not why he demonstrates his power, it's so that we can trust yes. him. And to, with all the challenges that we may face, that we can trust that He has the power to unleash in our lives so that we don't have to be desperate. We don't have to feel discouraged. But ultimately, when we see His power, it's so that we can trust Him even more. That's the goal. And so a lot of times, you know, we can, we can um, think about God the way we think about ourselves. We, we've got to really understand what this is all about. So I'm going to be uh, looking at Isaiah chapter 36 Amen. this morning. 36 and 37. And so we read... In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, King Sennacherib of Assyria marched up against all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. That there might be one of the most understated event in the scriptures. We read that literally Judah... If you understand the context of Isaiah 36 and 37, the context is that they, uh, Judah was laid with siege from all around, north, south, east, west. And that King Sennacherib, he really had had some amazing exploits in what he was doing. All his enemies were defeated. You know, it's interesting. When we understand this, it's sort of like the imagery that God is um, helping us to understand here from this scripture is not only what happened particularly with Judah, but also even in our lives, when we're surrounded all around, what happens? What are some things that we're going to see what God is able to do in light of what is going on. And so what happened was, so the king of Assyria marched up against the fortified cities of Judah, captured them. The king of Assyria sent his chief advisor from Lachish to King Hezekiah in Jerusalem along with the large army. So if you can picture this, there's a big army that this guy comes to talk to King Hezekiah the king of Judah. If you remember the scriptures, uh, Israel had been divided into two kingdoms, okay? The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Uh, the king of uh, Israel and Judah. And so K Judah, uh, for the most part, was a lot more faithful than uh, the, the Israelites. Um, but we're going to focus here on what happens in this entire situation. So it says... The chief advisor stood at the conduit of the upper pool, which is located on the road to the field where they wash and dry cloth. I guess that's some info information the Lord wanted us to know. Where the, where the local laundry was. We'll have to ask him, Lord, um, what was the deal there? Why do we know where the, la where the, um, where the laundry was operating? Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, the palace supervisor accompanied by Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, son of Asaph, the secretary, went out to meet him. So if you could picture what's happening here. So this guy comes, the chief advisor from 
uh, king of Assyria. He comes with a large army. I think part of the large army was to intimidate. You ever seen it? Yes. <laughs> you ever seen in those movies when these guys come? And then uh, uh, the guy who's talking a lot, and then there's, when he's got an entourage behind him, they, they talk a, li- a, a lot tougher and, and so on and so forth, right? And so what happens here, that's what he does. He comes, and then these three guys that are King Hezekiah's guys come up, and they talk to him. The chief advisor said to them, tell Hezekiah, this is what the great king, the king of Assyria says. What is your source of confidence? Your, you, your claim to have a strategy and military strength is just empty talk. In whom are you trusting? That you dare to rebel against me. And so these guys come up, and you, you got to see this picture. They come up and with intimidation at the heart of their discussion having just defeated all the armies that surrounded Judah, they are now emboldened in the way that they present themselves. You know, in our lives, there are a lot of times that when challenges occur, we can feel weakened. And then we think, man, is is Satan winning? Look at all the victories that the enemy has. And sometimes we get intimidated. And I really think that this event not only happened, but it's also a metaphor for our lives and the way that God acts. And sometimes... Our confidence can be taken away. And we don't speak with faith as we approach God or as we lay our plans before Him. Not our plans so much to build a bigger house and drive a nicer car and lose some weight and grow some hair and all that kind of stuff. But I'm talking about our plans for God in our lives. We don't have the scripture, but I'll, I'll read. I will continue to read the next, in the next section. It says, look, you must be trusting in Egypt that, sp- that splintered reed staff. If someone leans on it for support, it punctures his hand and wounds him. This is what Pharaoh, king of Egypt, does to all who trust him. So what he's saying is, listen, guys, you can, are you getting your source of strength from Egypt? You know what Egypt does? This is what they do. They suck you in. They get you dependent on them, and then they hurt you. They create a weakness in your life so that you are ultimately always dependent on them. That's what he does. That's what the, that's what king of... And so, you know, the, the, the chief advisor from the king of Assyria was somehow trying to give uh, King Hezekiah and his men good advice. He says, Listen, don't, go with, don't go with the king of Egypt. Because that's the way he treats you. Next, next verse. Perhaps you will tell me we are trusting the Lord our God. We'll get to this section a little bit. Um, this, uh, I'm just reading a little bit more. He says, perhaps you're going to tell me that you're going to trust in your God. And so get the picture in your mind, okay? So what's happening? King of Syria is now laying siege on Judah. They have just surrounded all the people, and they're finally in their game of monopoly, in their game of risk. They're about to conquer this little kingdom that Hezekiah was the king of, and they come to intimidate them. Hopefully they were 
thinking, what they were thinking perhaps, is that maybe we're not even going to have a fight, that they're going to lay down, and this is going to be pretty simple. Isaiah uh, 37, let's, let's continue. He told them, hey, listen, but before we get to verse 1, in uh, Isaiah 37, verse 1, he says, listen, if you surrender, we'll give you so many horses, as many as you can find people to ride them. Can we cut a deal here? You know, there are times in our life, I know in experiences with my life, there are times that I have gotten victories because Satan wasn't fighting against me, just to give me a false sense of security. I negotiated. I said, what can we do to ultimately win over? What is your price? Yeah. Let me ask you a question this morning. What is your price that you are willing to compromise at? Job? Or relationship? A career? What is it that can be offered to you that says, okay, just lay down? And that's what was going on here. These guys came to intimidate. They were, they were taunting the people who were living, living in Judah. So we pick it up. So these guys come back now after they've had this discussion, if you would, with the chief advisor from the king of Assyria. And so they come to report to King Hezekiah as to what their discussion was like. So we pick it up in verse 1. It says, when King Hezekiah heard this, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and went to the Lord's temple. Eliakim, the palace supervisor, Shebna, the scribe, and the leading priest clothed in sackcloth, sent this message to Isaiah, to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. This is what Hezekiah says. This is a day of distress, insults, and humiliation. Hezekiah is appalled at the way they're talking about God. They realize now that we're being insulted, we're being intimidated. And then in verse 5, uh, in Isaiah 35, 37, verse 5, it says, When King Hezekiah's servants came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Tell your master this. This is what the Lord says. Don't be afraid because of the things you have heard. These insults the king of Assyria's servants have hurled against me. That's pretty easy to say when it's not directed to you uh, specifically. I have found it is when things are going well, it is so easy to sing. Yes. <laughs> Our hugs are a little tighter. Man, if we were so inclined, we may throw a little bit more, a few more dollars in the plate. <laughs> we might come earlier to church. And so sometimes when these things come to the prophet, he says, listen, don't worry about it. Don't be afraid. Next verse. We continue to, to paint a picture of this story. It says, the king heard that King Terhaka of Ethiopia was marching out to fight him. He sent messengers to Hezekiah ordering them, tell King Hezekiah of Judah this, don't let your God in whom you trust mislead you when he says, Jerusalem will be handed over to the king of Assyria. Certainly, 
You have heard how the kings of Assyria have annihilated all lands. Do you understand my resume? Do you really think you will be rescued? Were the nations whom my predecessor destroyed the nation of their... Let me give you my resume of Gozan, Haran, Rezeb, and the people of Eden in Telassar rescued by their gods? Uh, where were the king of... By the way, if you didn't get all that I've done, where were the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, and the king of Lair? Where were they? And so what happened a lot, especially in the days of old, a lot of these nations had their gods that they worshipped to. And so these guys, because they did not know the Lord God, they came up to them and acted as if just it's the same God of these nations that they annihilated, they're going to do the same to God's own people. This is going to be a cakewalk. Well, let's continue. We will, in verse 20. Now, O Lord our God, rescue us from his power so all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. Isaiah, son of Amos, sent this message to Hezekiah. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Because you prayed to me concerning King Sennacherib of Assyria, this is what the Lord says about him. Next. The virgin daughter of Zion despises you. She makes fun of you. Daughter Jerusalem shakes her head after you, whom you have taunted and hurled insults at. At whom have you shouted and looked so arrogantly? At the Holy One of Israel. Though your message, th sorry, through your message, you taunted the sovereign master. With many chariots, I climbed up the high mountains, the slopes of Lebanon. I cut down all its tall cedars and its best evergreens. I invaded it most, its most remote regions and thickest woods. It's talking about their exploits once again. They continue to talk about what they have done. It says, they have burned. They have burned, in verse 20, Isaiah 37. Um, I dug wells with, um, and drank water with the soles of my feet. I dried up all the rivers of Egypt. The God of Israel was helping them to understand how powerful he is. In verse 33, we continue. It says this. So this is what the Lord says about the king of Assyria. He will not enter the city, nor will he shoot an arrow here. He will not attack it with his shielded warriors, nor will he build siege works against it. He will go back the way he came. He will not enter the city, says the Lord. I will shield this city and rescue it for the sake of my reputation and because of my promise to David, my servant. And so what God is saying, hey, listen. Through Isaiah the prophet, I've got you. As a matter of fact, these exploits that these guys told you how awesome they are, this is how this battle is going to be won. You are not going to have to lift a finger. Well, okay. You are not going to have to do anything. That's the power that rests in me. And I'm going to do this because my reputation is at stake. And because I fulfill all my promises. You know, when you are Christ ambassador and you are representing the Lord... There's an interesting dynamic, and I don't, I don't know exactly how it all works. But there are times that the Scripture says 
that God is interested in protecting the fact that he is Lord God. That he is, you, you are his ambassador and his reputation is at stake and therefore he will not be mocked. He says, Yo, there are promises also. You know, I know that heaven, so, heaven awaits me based solely on the promise of God. And I know because God is able to fulfill his promises, that's why I can have such confidence in the fact that one day he's going he's gonna to say the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Not because of anything magical. Not because I'm a part of this church. Not because I give 10% of my contribution. Not because I have studied the Bible with many people and they've become Christians. Not because I read the Bible so often or because I pray so often. Based solely on the promise of God that God can fulfill the promises that He has made. That's the idea of looking at this power. Can God fulfill this promise? When you go and buy a car or a house, you form a mortgage or a loan with a, with a particular bank or company, right? And what do they do? They look at your credit history and they say, do you have the power to fulfill this contract that you have signed? That's, that's the idea. Do you have that power to fulfill this boast, if you would? That's what God is doing and demonstrating his power here. And we look at how powerful he is. Is the idea, listen, God is able to fulfill his promises to you and I. And that he will fiercely protect his children. Especially those who cry out to him. And this is what it says in verse 36. The Lord's messenger went out and killed 185,000 troops in the Assyrian camp. When they got up the next morning, they were all corpses. So, sing, so King Sennacherib of Assyria broke camp and went on his way. He went home and stayed in Nineveh. I want you to notice, when God displayed his power, this guy who was arrogant to the nth degree literally took his tail in between his legs, did not even offer up any resistance, and went home. The Lord's messenger, the Bible tells us, destroyed God's enemies 185,000 in one night. One messenger. And I think the emphasis that God did not need to send a legion, that he did not need to send a company of soldiers, was why? To demonstrate to these guys, listen, I am not to be trifled with. The power that I possess is simply incredible. You remember the story of Sarah and Abraham? Yes. The, Sarah couldn't bear a child. She lost faith. She said to Abraham, hey, why don't you go ahead and sleep with one of my maidservants? The Lord said, that's not quite how it works in a relationship with me. It's not how we compromise. Remember, no one counsels me. I don't need directions. Ultimately, I don't need help from you on how to do this thing. I know I promised you that I, you will be a father of many nations. As you look up into the sky and you see that many stars or the sands on the seashore, that's how many children you're going to have. And so 
Sarah, like you and I, she's getting along in years and saying, oh, how is this going to happen again? Oh, maybe God has given us maidservants so that Abraham can sleep with them. Maybe that's the way he's figured it out. And so what happens here? Sarah is visited by an angel. And, and he said to her, um, you're going to have a child next year. And she starts, remember what she did? She started laughing. <laughs> Good one. And he said to her, why did you laugh? And she, said, she had the audacity to say, I didn't laugh. <laughs> yes, you laughed. And then they were questioning God's ability, and God asks a statement that I want you to think about for a few seconds. I know, really, because I know you've heard this statement before. And he says this, is anything too difficult for the Lord? I'm going to give you a couple seconds. Rather than a piece of paper, something that's too difficult for God. Why do we act like it sometimes, though? Why so much anxiety? Oh, my body's deteriorating. It's the end of my life. You can fill in the blank. Satan has a field day when he looks at his servant and they are not trusting in their God. <gasps> Had a chance to go to my brother's 60th birthday. There are seven of us in the family, seven children. And I'm the youngest of seven. And uh, age 60 to 51, there are seven children in that age. No twins. <laughs> Mom was busy for about a 10-year period. Basically, she's, she was pregnant for 10 consecutive years. Anyways, we sat down, and we had a great time. And we did it some time of reflection. We thought, wow. We remember when 60 was really old. <laughs> and the truth is, it came to the reality that we were, we were literally praising God that all nine of us, my mom and dad, and all seven children, are over 50 and everybody's alive. And that, that was a great thing. But it did not take away from the fact that we're getting old. Yeah. Things I used to be able to do, I can't do anymore. And I know when I'm not thinking in a spiritual way, I get worried about that. I get consumed about that. And so I work out harder, somehow trying to defy that ultimately... I'm getting old. Did you guys see the guy in Norway, I believe, or Sweden, or Amsterdam, one of those countries? He's literally suing the courts that he does not want to be the age that he is. He says, hey. And his rationale was, hey, hey, hey listen, if I don't want to be identified as a male, I can. If I don't want to be identified, and so he says, well, I don't want to be identified as being 58, I believe, is his age. I want to be younger. Okay. Even if he wins. <laughs> so somebody had a caption about this guy. He says, this guy needs to grow up. <laughs> but the point is we can't. And yet as we get older or certain parts of our lives, we try to defy what's happening when we live a faithless life or we're wondering, what's going to happen to me? 
This body is breaking down. My mind is writing checks my body cannot cash. <laughs> Especially when I play sports. I'm imagining laying up a basketball or going that high and I realize, oh my, my mind is telling me, but my body is somehow is, there's a disconnect. But in a more serious manner, there's things in our lives that we get so consumed about. Doesn't matter what age you are. And that's what happens. And so, what is it that's too difficult for God? Or do you remember when they were in the squall, when Jesus was in the boat? And they exclaimed, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the wave obey him? These guys were all panicking. Jesus was sleeping. And so the question is, who are you worshiping? This ultra-powerful God? Or someone who can't really accomplish much? And so this story reminds us, even though Judah was surrounded all around, God says, I've got you. As a matter of fact, in this particular battle, maybe some other ones you're going to have to take up swords, but in this particular battle, to demonstrate how powerful I am, you wouldn't have to lift a finger. And I know it looks like a lot of people are surrounded, 185,000 of them. Don't worry about it. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? Is it any wonder that the scripture tells us that we need supernatural power to understand how powerful God is? And so these stories are there so that we can lift our eyes up to Him. Who with just one of His messengers, God says, I don't need to take this fight on on my own. I send one of my guys. And it's not going to be long. This one's not going to take that long. Not that God can't accomplish his other feats in a short while, but in this particular one, his power, he wanted to have on full display. Yeah. Is it any wonder when Jesus faced the authorities of this day and age and he said to them, hey, I know you think you're powerful, but you would have no power if it were not given to you from above. Here, here is this guy who is saying to Jesus, listen, do you not, have, do you not realize I have the power to release you? He says, what are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? Do you realize you would have no power? Sometimes we fret over our bosses and we fret about the, our politicians. And trust me, I just moved from the States. It's a 24 hour, seven days a week, 365 day yelling at each other and they're all crooks. <laughs> trust me. Everybody has an angle. And it is stunning that they think that this solution can be found in the political system. It's insane. Listen, we need to perform our civic duties. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about our power and our hope does not rest on politicians or doctors or lawyers or my bosses. 
Uh, we need to be respectful and use those things. But I'm talking about our hope does not rest in that. It rests in this powerful God. Yeah. And so as we embark on the next few months in the Ottawa church, you better take a look around. This is as small as we're going to be. Enjoy this time of fellowship with your brothers and sisters. Because there's going to be a lot more coming in. Because we're going to look to this incomprehensible God. We're going to talk about this incomparable God. We're going to talk about this ultra-powerful God and see what He is going to do in our midst. Are these visions and goals? As long as they're giving all glory and honor to God, too difficult for the Lord? Listen, if you've got the winds and waves in his hand, the Bible tells us he controls people's hearts. He hardened Pharaoh's heart. He opened Lydia's heart. That's what he does. That's his business. And yet these outward display of power, I don't think is the most powerful thing. I really don't. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This would lead us actually into our communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul's writing to the church. And if you ever think that our church has problems, read the book of Corinthians. <laughs> it will encourage you in your heart. They had some issues, okay? Listen, we're, we don't have a perfect church because you and I are in it. Yeah. And this is what it says in verse 9. I love this. Paul's writing to church. He says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. The sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, passive homosexual partners, practicing homosexuals, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, and verbally abusive, and swindlers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul's writing, says, listen guys, I know you, you think you got a lifestyle. These people will not go to heaven. And then he says this. Some of you once lived this way. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. You know what Paul says? He says, listen, God has the transformative power even in our lives. Not only the fact that he can slay 185 souls, that's just pure snapshot. It's just for us to get a glimpse where we can put our hope that ultimately change lives in what God is all about. Change lives. You know, Melanie's mom is, is here. I remember when she was a non-Christian. I remind her all the time. I remember when I met uh, mom the first time, we went, on a, uh, we went on a date together, and she looked at me, and she says, what are your intentions with my daughter? <laughs> Mel, it's a very good question. And then after, I said, I, I love her, and we'll see where it goes. And she's, to see her change in her, her attitude towards the church before she was a disciple, and now oh, she's such a servant, giving her entire life to the cause. And yet, before, she was not happy about the church that stole her daughter and her son and her sister, daughter-in-law. and her other son. 
but the transformative nature of the power in us. That God can change. That is what they were. And so as we think about what Christ, when his power was ultimately displayed, sometimes God trips us up all the time. You know, his ultimate demonstration of his power when, was when he allowed his son to die on the cross. Could he have stopped it? Most ridiculous question of the day. Could he have stopped it? Sure he could. But it's for us to be able to have our lives transformed. And so what brings me joy and what brings me excitement this morning is not whether or not I, I have a stubbed toe and I pray that God will heal it. I'm not against that, but that's, that's not what fires me up. Or that I'm diabetic and I hope God really helps me out with my diabetes. Sure, I, yeah. I, no, but God has changed what my eternal destiny is. Amen. That I can say no to things that I was enslaved to before. That's true power. Yes. Yes. That's what I'm talking about. That was a demonstration. These incredible, epic David and Goliath was what? So that we can put our trust in him. And so as we take the Lord's Supper this morning, and we see that God's transforming power not only in the, in the demonstration of it by slaying 185,000 soldiers one night, but the transforming power of changing our lives that was found in the cross. Let us reflect on the power of God, not so that we can boast. God did not demonstrate His power. It's ultimately that we can trust Him. That's my goal this morning. That when you see the demonstration of God's power, it's not he was this egotistical person that wanted to display his power all the time. It's so that we can ultimately put our trust in him. Let us pray as we give thanks for the body and the blood of Christ. God, we're amazed how powerful you are that you spoke this world into existence, that you fulfilled your promise with King Hezekiah when you told him that you were going to defeat, defeat his enemies without lifting a sword. And ultimately, your power demonstrated not on the outward things, but how it has transformed our lives. And that we don't wage war as the world does. And we don't stress and fret as the world does. Not even death causes us to fret. That we don't act with pe like people who have no hope. But in death is where victory is ultimately found. That's so incredible. <laughs> that in the death of your son, that victory was ultimately found in that it's through that death we can be adopted as your children that you're so willing to fiercely protect. Help us to reflect this morning as we take the emblems that represent the body and the blood of Christ that we think about your son ultimately who turned an earthly and the most earthly the most powerful earthly kingdom, the Roman Empire of his day and age, and how, without lifting a sword, he literally transformed that entire kingdom simply with a message of love and peace. That's the God we serve. That's the God that we are praying to. And that's the God we entrust ourselves. Father, forgive us when we've not trusted you. 
forgive us when we fight among ourselves and we think that somebody's treated us unfairly and some, some person is in control of my life. Father, forgive us our faithlessness. And thank you that we have this time every week to refocus and recalibrate our hearts to say thank you, God. Thank you for your power demonstrated outwardly and inwardly. Thank you for the death of Christ and the shedding of his blood because it's been forgiveness of sins in our lives. Amen.